We are happy to have um, Margaret Pepper here, Marnie Pepper, and she's the district supervisor in USDA. She's a certified wildlife biologist and head of the Chesapeake Bay Nutria Eradic uh, Eradication Program and Dog Detector. I know that I've been showing up there those pretty little dogs, and we'll see how they have helped to save the bay. Um, Thank you, Marnie, for agreeing to come and share uh, the story of your work with us uh, tonight. Thank you, and thank you so much for all you coming out tonight and your interest in our program. Can everybody see my slideshow? Wonderful, thank you so much. We okay. can. And if you have questions, because unfortunately I'm working from home right now, I can't see the chat box. So if you have a question during the presentation, you know, please feel free to speak up. Or you can put it in the chat box and I'll, I'll speak it for you if you're, if you're shy. Perfect. Well, Nutria are non-native. They're originally from South America. They were brought here to Maryland in the early 1940s for their fur. Unfortunately, or fortunately for the Nutria at least, that market never established. And those animals either escaped on their own or some were, were intentionally released. They adapted very quickly to the wetland habitats of the Chesapeake Bay and their feeding habits tend to focus on one area and they'll target the root mats of the plants. So it directly impacts the integrity of the marsh and that will accelerate erosion processes. So what happens is the areas where the nutria feed extensively will convert to either open mud flats or open water. This is unfortunately very evident in Blackwater National Wildlife Refuge. If anybody here has been to Cambridge, Maryland, uh, I really hope that you stop by Blackwater National Wildlife Refuge. It is a gorgeous area. We have a lot of really neat, interesting wildlife, including a very healthy population of Delmarva fox squirrels. So if you're ever in the area, please stop on by. You won't regret it. It's, it's a very gorgeous area. Unfortunately, uh, it did take some, some hit from the nutria. This is a picture of the wetlands at Blackwater off of Wildlife Drive. And this is prior to nutria being on the landscape. And you can see it's a beautiful marsh system, canals, you know, ponds, beautiful, healthy, thriving, uh, system. And then this is a picture after Nutria were on the landscape. And as you can see, a lot of those areas have been converted to open water. In Blackwater National Wildlife Refuge alone, 5,000 acres have been lost in part to Nutria. So that is quite a devastating impact uh, that these rodents can have. And unfortunately, that those marshes that have been lost are to the point now where in order to restore them, you need to go through a very extensive process to build up that nutrient layer so that you can actually get plants to grow and, and reestablish that marsh. This was a huge problem a number of reasons. Uh, economically, the Chesapeake Bay provides, provides nursery for shellfish and other economically important resources. And so there was the impact to the fishermen, to the crabbers, to the, to the turtlers. Uh, ecologically, these systems, these wetland systems of the Chesapeake Bay host a number of species that are in, in many of them are unique to those systems. They can't occupy other areas. You're not going to find your 
your black rails or your clapper rails or some of these wetland birds in your backyard. They only occur in these wetland systems. And if the nutria eat the habitat, then these other native species have no place to exist. And then the other aspect that sometimes we overlook is the cultural aspect. The Chesapeake Bay is an important part of a lot of the, the local people's lives. A lot of their traditions are deeply seated in the Chesapeake Bay. They grew up, uh, some of them have livelihoods that, that directly depend on it. And if you're ever in the area again of Cambridge, um, more particularly Golden Hill, in late February, they have the National Outdoor Show. This is a really neat event. It is probably, except for in Louisiana, probably the only place where you have a beauty pageant and a muskrat skinning contest all in the same venue. Uh, it's, it's a really neat event. Uh, they do all kinds of demonstrations for different activities that occur on the Chesapeake Bay, like muskrat, they do demonstrations. And again, they have the, the beauty contest and, and whatnot, and lots of fun activities and displays for folks to enjoy. It, <laughs> the last couple of years, it has, um, there were the last two years, it hasn't been because of COVID, but hopefully it will uh, again occur. And if, when it does, I really encourage folks to check it out. Because it would have been ecologically, economically, and culturally irresponsible not to address nutria, we knew that something needed to be done. But it was such a monumental task and a complex problem that not one single agency could take it on solo. And that's one of the neat aspects of the Chesapeake Bay Eradication Project. We are a partnership of over 25 different organizations that came together to address this problem. The core management team consists of the US Fish and Wildlife Service, and they provide the bulk of the funding and management. The agency that I represent, USDA Wildlife Services, we do the on the ground operations planning and management. So there were the ones that go out, we do the monitoring, we look for nutria and, and those sorts of things. We also work very closely with Maryland Department of Natural Resources. And we've had uh, support from some local landowners. Uh, Tudor Farms is a, is a large landowner. Uh, he, they since sold the farm, but they were very supportive in the very beginning with allowing access to their properties for some research and then also providing funding as well. So as you can see, a lot of people came to the table with different backgrounds and having that diversity was very important for a successful program. Everybody brought different skills, ideas to the table and that is one of the main reasons we've been so successful. This is, uh, picture of the Delmarva Peninsula. So the goal of our program is to eradicate nutria from the entire Delmarva Peninsula. So this is our search area. We found nine watersheds infested with nutria. These watersheds have been trapped out. And to date, we have removed almost 14,000 nutria since our program began in 2002. This has directly resulted in approximately a quarter million acres of wetlands being protected. And over 400 private landowners have received direct assistance and many more indirectly have benefited from the operations of our program. I'm very happy to say that the last confirmed detection of a nutria was May 7th, 2015. That seems, you know, that's, that's a huge milestone but it doesn't mean that nutria are eradicated from the peninsula. The, we still have many areas that we need to look. It is a large search area. So we are branching out and searching some of the non-traditional areas, but places where nutria very well could exist. 
our goal is to be able to declare eradication sometime in the, in the summer of 2022. We just wrapped up some intense monitoring of the areas that had nutria. These are, are pictured here. This is the areas where we trapped out populations and we hadn't had a detection again since the 2015. So we have been doing a cycle of monitoring in these zones and we've been doing what we call saturation monitoring. So what you see there on the uh, right side of the screen is a GIS representation of the different monitoring techniques that we do. And we would go through each one of these areas and basically hit it with every monitoring tool we have to help ensure that nutria were absent from the landscape. And that's a really hard thing to do because it's a lot easier to prove something exists. If you find it, it's there. It's really hard to prove something doesn't exist because if you don't find it, well, is it not there or did you just not find it? And that's why we use a number of different techniques. And I'm going to talk about them now. So we take an integrated approach to surveying for nutria. We will do ground surveys. This means just going out into the wetlands and, and walking areas looking for nutria sign. When we go out, we look for tracks, we look for scat. Nutria will make very um, rudimentary beds in the marsh. What it, they'll do is they'll mat down vegetation and you'll find these sort of platforms. Uh, muskrats will do that as well, but nutria, theirs look slightly different. And a lot of times you'll find scat on top of their little beds. So we will look for different sign that tell us that nutria are using those areas. We do shoreline surveys and that could be with a, a typical John boat uh, or kayaks, canoes, um, everything. My crew recently requested the use of paddle boards and I said, no, I don't think that that's an appropriate <laughs> method of detecting nutria. Of course they were joking, but you know, it, it is uh, certainly a way that you could possibly explore the shoreline. We use trail cameras. Uh, trail cameras have come a long way and have proven themselves as a, as a very useful method for, for a, not only detecting wildlife, but also monitoring and understanding some of their behavior. Uh, so we use trail cameras. We also have monitoring platforms. These are two by two floating wraps. You can see they're pictured there in the bottom uh, right corner. These represent sort of a, a, a dry area that, that a nutria might be attracted to to climb out and kind of groom and rest. Uh, it sort of loosely represents what we call a nutria bed. And what they'll do is a lot of times when they're up on these rafts, they'll defecate. Uh, and if they do, then we can check that raft and we can find the scat and know that it's a nutria. We also have what's pictured there just above the platform is a hair snare. And what that does, it pulls a little tiny sample of nutria hair when one climbs up and we can take that snare back to the lab and identify whether it was a nutria or something else that climbed up on the platform. So it helps us again, we can put those out in the marsh, we'll put them out from the road. In fact, if you go uh, anywhere on the Eastern shore, you might come across one of our platforms. They usually confuse people because of the hair snares and they're not really quite sure what they're for. The hair snares do not harm the animal. Again, it just simply pulls a little hair sample and half the time that they don't even notice that it's there. It's for them, it's just like going through a briar patch. And then also we use the canines and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the canines uh, after I uh, summarize some of our project. We, now, we used to have uh, hunting dogs that were trained to bay nutria. And we more recently in 2014 expanded and developed a detector dog program uh, using canines to actually locate and respond to the scat of nutria. And again, I'll explain uh, some of that in a minute. 
But here's some uh, cool videos. This is Nutria on one of our monitoring platforms. So you can see they have a two Nutria capacity. And they are fairly sizable rodents. Uh, we have had, I think, one of our larger ones was 17 pounds. I've been talking with California because they actually now have uh, a Nutria problem. They had Nutria in California in the 70s. And in 2017, they discovered a Nutria in one of their wetlands in the Delta or south of the Delta. And their, their biggest Nutria that they've had was almost 25 pounds. So that's the very sizable rodent. <laughs> And you can see this, that Nutria, he's climbed up and now he's just gonna groom and they will spend anywhere from a minute to almost an hour just sitting up there grooming and, and resting for a while. Hey, Marnie, what would, I mean, would it be a log that they would be sitting on? Um, or I mean, what, what does this mimic in a, in a natural wetland area? It could be a log, it could be a muskrat house. Uh, in fact, when we're walking through the marsh, we look for we look at muskrat houses because a lot of times when the tide's high they'll climb up on a muskrat house because it's one of the highest points and it's dry and you'll find scat on the top of the muskrat houses oops and then this is an example of the hair snare actually taking a sample So you can see he's he's oblivious that he has two hair snares now that are ready to take a little sample when he leaves. And he goes about his little nutria way. And we have two two of those snares now have uh, nutria hair on them. So when we go and collect those samples, we can identify, yep, there's nutria. Uh, we need to go back to this area and do some additional surveys. talk about some of the conservation outcomes. This is a marsh that was located on the Choptank River. I think it was about 80 nutria we removed from this area. And as you can see, there's evidence of their feeding. You, you have already water starting to pool. You can see this you know, devoid of vegetation. If this area was left, it would eventually convert to open water. And as I had said at the beginning uh, with Blackwater, it would be very hard to bring that marsh back without adding more material and encouraging you know, more plant growth. We were able to get in there. We quickly removed the nutria. And in just two growing seasons, this is how the marsh responded. And that's one of the really neat things about marsh or wetlands is they are very dynamic systems. They can experience this kind of pressure. They just can't experience it for a prolonged period to the point where they're eroded and now you have standing water. So I think of all the things that, that our project has been able to accomplish, I think being able to see firsthand the results, these conservation outcomes is what really has driven our employees, you know, to do the work that they do. You're outside all the time. It's 80 degrees, it's 90 degrees, it's 10 degrees, it's cold, it's ice, you're breaking ice to get your boat through the marsh. You know, it is, it is a very harsh environment to work in. And I think when you can see, when you have these tangible results, I think that is really what drives a lot of our employees and really gives them a sense of pride is that they can see firsthand that they're protecting those resources. Now I'm going to switch gears a little and talk about our detector dogs. Oops, I don't know why it jumped. Uh, so as I explained in the beginning, we first had hunting dogs that assisted with baying nutria. 
So they would seek out the animal itself, they would trail it, and they would actually bay it and hold it in place until the handler could come and, and get the nutria. We would actually, with some of our research that we've done, we would use the dogs to, to hand capture animals when we were doing uh, some of our captive uh, animals we, did, we used for research. So they were very helpful in a number of ways, uh, not only in removal, but in, in situations where we needed to live capture an animal because it had a transmitter on it and we didn't want to you know, lethally remove it. But as our project continued and nutrient populations were becoming less and less, uh, we couldn't maintain those hunting dogs. The training opportunities weren't there and you couldn't maintain it. So that's when we decided, well, we still want canines, but now we need to adapt to the changing needs of the program. And so that's when we decided that we needed to partner with the National Detector Dog Training Center and focus on training detector dogs. And this is this is the first dog that I worked, Kiva, and she's sitting there planning out where we were going to work that day. <laughs> As I said, uh, the National Detector Dog Training Center, this is a USDA program with plant protection and quarantine. These are the folks that train the dogs that work at the airport. If you guys have ever seen the Beagle Brigade at the airports, these are the folks that train them. They train them on agricultural produce, uh, things that might be coming across the border that needs to be checked and you know, helping to ensure that agricultural pests don't make it into our system. They didn't really train dogs in the capacity that we were looking for, but they trained detector dogs. It's basically the same idea, but they had never trained dogs to actually find scat. So, it was a little bit of a, a learning experience for them because a lot of the work that they did were inside warehouses or in the airport and they needed to bring that training and concept out in the marsh. So we kind of really worked together as a team to get this program going. And it was a really neat experience. The dogs that we use some come from shelters, uh, rescues. A lot of them are pets that people get as, or puppies and they are just the kind of dog that needs a job. They're tearing the couch apart. They've got high energy. And the ones that we use are, have what we call high toy drive. So these are dogs that wanna play fetch all day long. They don't, um, they're not content sitting on the couch eating potato chips. They're not couch potatoes. They want to be doing something at all times and having the kind of structure that we can provide is what really makes them uh, content and less destructive. You know, they're the kind of dogs that sometimes don't necessarily make good pets for a majority of folks because they can't give them the attention and the exercise they need, but we can. And luckily for them, there is this option where they can go out and, and provide a really important service. When we, we find the dogs that we want to procure for this type of work, they're sent down to the training center in Georgia. And this is where they are taught the odor that they're looking for. And so in our case, we're training them on Nutria scat. We have freezers and multiple freezers that are dedicated solely to Nutria scat. And there's, there's signs on it like, do not contaminate these freezers. <laughs> they have Nutria scat in them. And We've had a lot of interesting conversation with people as we, we reach out to folks to get scat samples from different states. And I explained to them the, this, the protocols for ensuring that the scat samples aren't tainted or you know, uh, messed up. And like, no, no, they have to be you know, handled a certain way so that they're not contaminated. They're like, well, this is, this is rat poop. <laughs> but 
it's important because we want the dogs to cue in on the nutria scat and not another odor that, you know, if you put it in the same bag as your ham sandwich, well, then the dog smelling nutria scat and your ham sandwich. So it's important to, to keep them separate. Uh, but it does make for some interesting conversations. <laughs> the response that we use for our dogs is a, is a bark response. So when the dog goes out into the field and it finds a nutria scat, it will bark to alert us that it found its target. And when it does, we reward the dog with playing a game of fetch. And you know, from the dog standpoint, the whole thing is a game. Once the dogs learn the basic concepts of what they're looking for, you know, understanding the, the odor, then they're brought up to Maryland where we do the live environment training. And this is where we develop the operational skills, working the dog in the marsh, and um, we will introduce other targets. So uh, the dogs that we use can be taught um, you know, multiple targets. And so they'll look for different things while they're surveying the environment. We've introduced them to uh, wild pig or feral swine scat because it is something that other programs are trying to eradicate. So it's very similar to what we do with Nutria and they have similar needs where we think we've got them all, but we need another method to survey to ensure that we did. And in some areas, the dogs may be looking for both wild pigs or nutria because both of them, they don't want on the landscape. And it's kind of neat. Uh, in some of the literature, they've trained dogs up to 15 different odors. So it's, it's pretty impressive what they can do. And we always say the dog's the easy part of the training. They, they, you know, they love to work. They, they do what they do. It's the handler that's the harder person to train. <laughs> and this is a video. Uh, this is showing one of our dogs finding wild pig scat. I'm gonna play this. Can you hear the sound? Okay. So this is Rex. He's, uh, he's actually one of our first dogs that uh, entered the program. You can see he's searching a field here with his handler. And right there he hits the odor. So he can smell scat and he's seeking it out to find it. And he's very excited that he found it because he knows he's going to get to play. Target. Yes, sir. Good boy. Good job. Good boy. And Rex would be happy if Dean would just throw that wubba all day long. He's not going to get tired. Dean's arm is going to fall off first. <laughs> and there's the scat. It's hidden underneath the uh, corn there. All of our dogs have GPS collars so that we can quantify the areas that they covered we found that they can survey up to two and a half times what the handlers survey. Uh, and it's how much more they cover is really gonna depend on the environment we're in. In some areas where they can really range, you know, it's, it's easier walking, they can cover a lot of area in a short period of time. We also have bells on all of the dogs. And the reason for that is because sometimes we work in very dense vegetation. It helps the handler keep track of the dog. It also helps tell wildlife that there's a dog in the area. And all of our dogs are trained to ignore wildlife. So when we're walking around, if a deer jumps up, what the dog will do is it'll come back to the handler and what we'll do, we call a reset. So the dog comes back and what we'll do is say, okay, good, good boy, good girl. And then we will start our survey again. A lot of things uh, we need to consider when we're working in the environment. Everybody asks, well, how, you know, how proficient are they as a detection tool? And a lot of that is gonna depend on the weather, wind, precipitation, the terrain, the handler. Uh, you know, it's important that when you're working a dog that you're setting the dog up for success. So you're working into the wind so the dog can smell the odor. 
the, the reality is if the dog is upwind from the target, it's not going to be able to smell it. So the handler has to set up the survey so that the dog's put in a situation that it's going to be successful. And then also the canine health. Uh, and that's why we do checks on the dogs before they go out in the field and we check them again when they come back. A lot of these dogs are very high energy. Uh, you know, they could they could have an injury and they're not gonna, they're just gonna keep on going because they're so high energy. And that's why it's important that the handler does sort of a, a daily health check where they look over the entire dog to make sure that everything's okay. And we've got some fun videos. We got a hold of a GoPro camera and of course we were gonna put it on dogs. So this is actually Kane. He came from a, uh, he came from Montgomery County, Montgomery County Animal Control. Uh, he was surrendered because he was too much for his previous owner, but he found a great job working for us. And I wish I had video of this whole scenario because Kane's handler, Mario, was actually going in another direction. And Kane veered off from him and headed towards this cattail patch because that's where the nutria were. So it was a really great video of, I wish I had, of Kane just veering away from his handler to go follow up or follow his nose. So there he goes over to the cattail patch. And there's, there's a nutria bed there, you can't see it, but there was a scat on it. And now he looks for his handler. And of course, Mario's playing catch up, trying to catch up with him. He finds Mario, brings him back. And because this is a wild situation, I'm coming in to verify, you can see I have my little whirl pack and gloves on. I'm there to verify that there is scat. And as soon as I do, he gets to play with his wubba. <laughs> And I believe we lost the camera maybe 30 seconds later. <laughs> this is uh, the view from the scat. So another command that we teach the dog is show me, which tells the dog that it needs to pinpoint the exact location of the scat. So put your nose on the scat and show me exactly where it is. And this is Brady. He has show me and she puts her nose right on it and gets a reward. Oops, there you go. As I said, we've branched out and trained the dogs with different odors uh, and thus have had some really great projects that we've been able to be involved with. And with those projects come new distractions. And this is what makes being involved with such a diverse you know, study so helpful is that these dogs get to experience a lot of different things that they might not normally get to experience. And it ultimately <coughs> makes them better, better dogs. When we got a uh, contract to work out in California, we were looking for wild pigs. And I was talking to the biologist there and I said, well, what should we prepare for in California? Because, you know, it's gonna be a whole new environment. And the first thing they said was cows. The dog is gonna come in contact with lots and lots of cows. And I said, oh, well, that's good to know because our dogs, I don't know that they've ever met a cow. So we should probably introduce them before we get out there. And so we called up a, a farmer who had some cows and we ran exercises with the dogs. And the neat thing was that the dogs really didn't care much about the cows because they're so driven to do their job. They want their toys, so they really could care less about distractions. The cows, on the other hand, were really curious about what the dogs were doing. So we would look over and you'd have a herd of cows watching you. And it was really neat. 
Uh, but again, it, it, it really helped us prepare for going out to these areas. You know, they worked around bison, uh, nesting birds, porcupines, which is an important one too. Uh, it's important that you, you learn to give them a wide berth. We've done uh, nutria work in Madame Mesquite Wildlife Refuge in North Carolina, uh, Fort Eustis, Virginia, which is around Norfolk. They've had us out a couple of times uh, to do surveys on the military base there. And that was that's interesting too, because the distractions there are a lot of, um, you know, military maneuvers. They'll be doing different demos, helicopters. So again, it's just more experience with the dogs working around distractions. And we are slated to travel there, there next week with the dogs to do some surveys. So we're excited. That's the first trip that we've been approved for since uh, about a year and a half now. We, this is um, obviously that didn't quite work out for California. We were slated to go in March of 2020. And just as our trip was planned was when all the travel restrictions came in place. And it was for good because obviously it would not have been a good idea to go out there at that time. So we're still hoping that we can make it out to California um, sometime in the near future. For wild pig work, we've been to Falls Cape State Park in Virginia, the Palomar Mountains of California, Salt Lake City, Utah, and Vermont and New Hampshire. And again, a lot of neat environments, a lot of new uh, areas to cover with the dogs. It's a lot of fun. More recently, uh, we were contacted by folks out of our research office. They had concerns about African swine sickness. This is a viral disease that affects domestic and, and wild pigs. It is not in the United States, but it is um, documented in other countries. And the fear is that if we had an outbreak in the United States, it would be something that we would wanna contain very quickly. And they wanted to know if our dogs could find carcasses of pigs uh, in the environment, and this would help with their rapid response. So if, and hopefully there will not be, but if there was an outbreak, we would be uh, deployed to those areas and we would be sent into the environment looking for carcasses so that they could quickly find them and dispose of them properly. It's not transferable to the dog, but it is transferable to the pigs. And that's the big concern um, with the USDA is like we don't want it getting into the, the domestic stock. This is our, our dog team. Uh, we have Tide, she's a chocolate lab. Encore, who's a black lab mix. Brady, who's a black lab mix. And Benny, who's our newest dog. And yes, that is slobber all over his face. He is uh, just a big goofy lab. Uh, he came from Alabama and he just recently uh, passed his validation and became operational about a couple months ago. So he's still getting his marsh feet, but he's absolutely loving it. And this is our dog teams. And uh, the gentleman there all the way to the left is uh, training specialist, James Mason. He works for the detection center in Georgia. And he, again, he trains the Beagles for the Beagle Brigade and uh, a lot of other special programs for the USDA. And with that, I thank you all for your attention and I'm happy to answer any questions. That's wonderful, Marty. Can you um, unshare and we can all come back together? There are a few questions and I'm sure that there are more. Sure. Sorry, I was just turning on my light. <laughs> Got dark. Yeah, you kept you, you kept getting uh, progressively darker. As <laughs> I know, I know. I was like, oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> so stop sharing. There we go. Okay, we have one. Um, well, let's see. Judy wrote that um, she read that tracking devices were attached to Nutria to lead the eradication project to their nests. And were you involved with that? Yes, so the what we had done, nutria are semi-gregarious. That means that they, they form sort of these loose groups. 
And what we did is we worked with the state veterinarian and we sterilized the nutria. And then we fitted them with radio collars. And once we did that, they got their health check. They were sent back into the environment because they would seek out other nutria. And so we did a couple of test runs with this where we re-released -re them, although they were sterilized, and they would actually lead us to other nutria populations. On the very last run that we did, there, we don't believe there were any nutria in the area. What our, our research animals did was they actually found each other. So it was kind of neat. We released them at all these different locations and they actually all came together and were occupying a marsh, uh, you know, one of the areas. We also learned a lot about their movements. Um, we, we manually tracked them because this was several years ago. The technology has advanced quite a bit, but we could manually track them. And then we also had sort of a data logger on them. So during the day, we would go out and locate them. And then once we recaptured them, we would download the data logger. And what we found was they would make these big movements at night that we were missing because they kept coming back to the same area. And, and one of them actually came back to the marsh just behind our office, <laughs> back where we have our facility. And he was hanging out right behind us during the day. And then at night, he would go two miles up river or down river onto the refuge and then come back and be there the next morning. So really cool. It's really cool to get a, a glimpse inside their lives. Um, let's see, we have, doo -doo -doo -doo. so how, how common are the nutria? We had a, a question, would you be, would you find them on the Western shore? Um, because, uh, uh, some, some, someone may have seen one. They, How would you identify it? Historically, there were nutria on the Western shore. There have not been any confirmed cases in many years. I think 20 plus years at this point. Uh, those were all very historical references. It's certainly possible, you know, anything's possible. We have resources on our website and maybe I can share that with you later that you can share with the group. And it has a, a little ID brochure that breaks down the tracks, the scat and different characteristics to help folks identify a nutria versus a muskrat versus a beaver. One of the things that's been very interesting with my involvement has been actually with beaver. Because when I started in 2010, and even prior to that doing the work in the area, we didn't have a lot of beaver. It was something that if you saw one, it was, whoa, hey, I, you know, this is different. You know, you don't typically see. Now we go out to areas and we are finding lots of beaver sign. The, which is a good thing, you know, they do create habitat. Sometimes it can be a problem, uh, but you know, that's like everything, <laughs> you know, everything's good in moderation. Uh, but we would see these different areas where you would find beaver and it, they weren't typical places that we would see them. And when you see a beaver in the water and you don't, you can't see the tail or anything else, it looks very, very similar to a nutrient. It's very hard to tell them apart. You would think that the tail would be very obvious, but it's, it is very difficult. So you think there's a correlation between the, the eradication of the nutria and the resurgence of the beaver? I don't think so. I think that has to do just with, you know, differences in, in habitat protection and those sorts of things. I don't think that the removal of the nutria per se Obviously, in situations where nutria were destroying habitat, it was, a, you know, removing that resource for those animals. So having an impact, but I think the resurgence in population is not probably directly because of the nutria. All right. Any other questions? You can raise your hand. You can unmute. I'll, I'll recognize you if you want to, to unmute. 
it looks like somebody. Um... Oh, you, uh, Jean. What? What? We'll go ahead. Oh, I see you're using lots of different methods to figure out where they are, and uh, I wonder if some of those methods are uh, much better when the population density is really low and others are good for finding, finding hot spots. So what's your experience been, you know, comparing one, one search method with another? We've tried to look at that and yes, density certainly does predict success in probably all of our methods. They have different values in sort of how they're used. So the platforms don't have a lot of time involvement. You can throw out a dozen of them across a large area and they can sit there for a month, two months, and they're working for you. You know, the, the ground surveys are probably your most taxing as far as time and effort. So for those, you're going to have to target your high probability spots. So we've tried to look at, you know, is this one better? Or we make more detections with this or that. We've, we found historically the ground surveys were typically where we picked them up. But then as we got towards the end, the platforms were also very helpful, but that was probably because they were spread out over a larger area. So you had a wider net. Because our end goal is eradication, we, could, we can't just simply rely on any one method. And that's why we incorporate all of them so that if I miss it with this one, I hopefully catch it with this one. If I don't catch it with that one, hopefully I catch it with this one. So, and, and did you publish any of that comparative data about what you picked up with method B compared to C compared to D, or is that, are those data available anywhere? We, we did, I, uh, back, I think it's in Biological Invasions 2017, there is an evaluation of detection methods that looks at platforms, hair snares, and trail cameras. And that one, it's Pepper. Uh, I can send that information out if if you want if you want to research that article. Uh, and the interesting thing about that is we looked at so platforms if they were set on land versus platforms set on water, and then we also looked at the platform itself as a detection method. So just relying on the nutria to deposit scat on the platform, the hair snares and then the trail camera. And what we found was the hair snares and the trail camera were almost equal in their ability to detect a nutria. So the value to that is a hair snare costs about 30 cents, well, probably now 50 cents to make. And a trail camera is gonna cost you 200 bucks and you may inadvertently donate it to the public. You know, the hair snare is not very appealing. So chances are people just leave them alone. That to us was very valuable information because it meant instead of using your resources to buy trail cameras, you could get the same thing just using these hair snares. And we've tried to reach out to anybody that's doing research, especially with like DNA sampling. These hair snares are very simple to make. They were created by a specialist on our project. He was waiting for his kids at the school bus, was trying to figure out a design for catching hair. And he was inspired by uh, some of the plants, you know, how their seeds stick to you. And that's what led him to the development of the hair snare we use today. Marnie, are you, um, are you keeping those hair samples and are you um, using them for DNA um, uh, testing? We have not use the, the Nutria hair sample because when we were getting them, we, at that point, the DNA for us wasn't as valuable because we didn't have, you know, you're not gonna tell much about the population at this point. 
we're now re, we're now revisiting that because we're working with other states that do have larger populations and are interested in you know the relatedness of their populations like california is very interested in the dna because they want to know the nutria that they found in 2017 were they nutria that somebody brought in from like oregon or washington state or were they nutria that just were not detected from that original population that they had in the 1970s the other value of the DNA is we are working with our folks out of Fort Collins, the, the research station. They are trying to develop an assay or they're working to develop an assay for eDNA. So eDNA is looking at taking samples of the environment, so water or soil, and looking for DNA of nutria. And the reason this would be valuable is you could sample water, you know, water samples from the Wicomico or water samples from anywhere and see is nutria DNA present? And if it is, well, then you need to follow up with, with other methods. But it's still in the very uh, early stages. They've developed methods to detect other animals this way. Uh, so I think it has a lot of promise. All right, Ruan, you had a question? Okay. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, I guess um, I might start out with an, like a, a, a local type of question. Um, I went on a sort of a photo walk in my, my area in Howard County. And there was this, I guess, again, I've seen beaver in, in the Lake Elkhorn. Um, however, this was definitely a small, something smaller uh, rodent and couldn't tell if it was maybe a muskrat or lesser desirable <laughs> to mention a, a rat, <laughs> but, um, but it was swimming extensively. Um, I heard people along the trail saying, you know, they saw this thing way far away and it probably swam along the shoreline at least a half a mile. And I was like, do you have a sense of the extent of how, how far or how common the nutrient problem has extended into Maryland, into the mainland part of Maryland? And or with reference to, I don't know if nutrient might have webbed feet, um, but if it's something where that particular adaptation in the invasive species is adding to the difficulties of, of dealing with them because they are maybe truly more aquatic in nature. Yeah, so it's it's possible it could be a muskrat. Uh, they yeah, muskrat, very, right. okay. Yeah, it, they, they're very common. They are they swim extensively. Uh, a lot of times, one of the easy ways to tell, and of course, it's just like everything else, is like usually, but not always. Mm -hmm. When a muskrat's swimming, he flicks his tail. So mm -hmm. a lot of times he's using his tail to That's tell a rudder. To propel. Yeah. The nutria, its tail is just kind of like there. It's not Dang really well. doing much of anything. It's balanced. It's, but oh. muskrats flicker their tail. Uh, they are very common, especially in the springtime. That's usually when we get a lot of sightings because they're active. They're out and about doing what muskrats do and, you know, making more muskrats. Mm -hmm. And so you do see them more frequently, especially this time of year. Okay. You can also look at the tracks. And if you're ever in an area where you're like, okay, well, I'm not really sure um, take pictures, you know, cell, phone, cell phones are a blessing and a curse. They have really helped us with the public because they can send us, you, you can send us pictures of scat, you can send us pictures of, of tracks and, and things like that. And a lot of times we can look at that and say, ooh, yeah, we might want to visit that. Or we can say, oh, oh, nope, nope, I can tell you what this is. It's a muskrat and here's why. Okay. Um... A few other things I made notes um, through the presentation. 
are nutria sort of social creatures with a colony structure, like a large colony structure at times? You mentioned sometimes they sort of have uh, various groupings, but again, with relate with that sort of um, maybe social structure some, at some point in, in their life, you know, lifespan or whatever. Um, I guess control strategies, um, I don't know, sometimes is, is it been observed that there have been population variations dependent if, if something like a um, like a disease for the colony passes through that area real quick and then and then you're actually noting that for your sort of control strategies like as a reference point potentially to to um, to evaluate and assist sometimes in your in your efforts well usually so the from the literature in like brazil where they're native to you're looking at uh generally like 11 to 12 individuals in, in, a, in a colony or a group and, it, and again it's okay. a loose group and it's, a lot of times it's a dominant male with the females and then you have your satellite males mm. uh we would take biological data on any animals that were removed so we looked at sex, age structure, pregnancy, uh, those sorts of things to kind of get an idea of the populations that we were targeting. Uh, we didn't notice any trends with like any disease or, or things like that. And part of that is because one of the reasons why Nutria were selected was because they were ideal for, for farming and keeping in captivity. And they are a generalist as far as their diet. They'll eat just about anything. Mm. Uh, they also are fairly disease resistant. They're, they're fairly a, a healthy animal. And, and again, that's part of the reason why they were able to expand uh, once they were in our wetlands. Mm. But surely, yep, keeping track of the, that information is important because you just never know what trend or information may come of it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, last thing, I don't know if this is really um, so much about Nutria, but more so about the care of the dogs and uh, the staff themselves, because I noticed you guys have like extensive um, tracking activity, like off, off roads, or if you want to say off trail, mm -hmm. even to that extent, and it must be a very tiresome and, and, and grueling, I'm sure, at, 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 you know, many times <laughs> demanding, if, if nothing else. But the thing is, um, sorry, my background is public health, so my, my, my questions are going to be a little bit on the, on the, on the odd side. <laughs> no, no, but, no. Um, but I guess with that level of exhaustion, as well as, you know, intense um, effort, um, things like exposure to ticks and stuff. Um, I, I, I'm a little concerned. I know you guys have all sorts of layers of, of care wo woven into your program because, because of all the investment into the, into the animals as well as the staff health and all that. But, um, I guess, um, as far as, um, routine care and tick checks um is that is that part of a uh, part of the outdoor um sort of um um protocols protocol i i, I don't want to overuse that but no, no, <laughs> i was no, looking no. for another word choice but um yeah i guess um because again um it must be sort of difficult because they are all over the place um, in, in their tracking. And um, if there are vaccines, veterinary vaccines and or like prophylaxis for some of these things, um, I guess, you know, that, that could be one of those extra um, layers of unseen costs and, and 
extra maintenance care that that the general public may not know about that that is really um, attributed to you guys as far as the 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 um, good good level of care and stuff that you you give to the dogs and the, and, and your staff especially so but um do you have any comments on on any of that yes well as far as the dogs are concerned they are routinely checked uh we do they do we do take them to the vet frequently they are vaccinated against lyme disease okay. uh they are checked there, we joke there's more there's more regulations on the dogs <laughs> than there are on the people uh and we as far as like the dog it's the the handler has to be cognizant of the dog because the dog's not going to make good decisions in yeah. terms of you know i can do this and it's like no <laughs> no you need a break yeah so we we do we do take that into consideration especially when we're on projects that take us to different areas. We don't, we have regulation as like how often they get worked. And a lot of that is just guidelines because at the end of the day, the handler has to look at the dog and say, okay, yeah, he needs a break today. And they, we always err on the side of caution. And, you know, we do that. As far as the, the health concerns to the people, I think it's just like in any other occupation, you know, if you decide to go into the medical field or, you know, you're working as an EMS person, there are certain risks that are associated with your job. When you become a wildlife biologist, you realize that, yeah, you're going to be exposed to different diseases and things that most normal people aren't. Uh, we are all, we all have the rabies vaccine. So, you know, we, if we are exposed, we still have to get a follow-up booster shot, but we have the vaccine yeah. to give us that extra layer of protection. And we get our titer checked, so they make sure that it's still active in our system and we're still protected. We all do tick checks, you know, that's, <laughs> yeah, we, you can see the text message, you know, guy found five today or whatever. And, and that's, again, part of being in that discipline is you know that those are things you're going to be exposed to. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Any other questions for Marnie? Yep, Jean. Jean, you're muted. And I, I suppose you know about permethrin as the best. Yes. Yes. And, yep. and that DEET, and that DEET is not. The, the data for DEET actually don't seem to exist. So the no. claims that the claims that DEET is a is a, is a repellent at least for deer ticks, a uh, DEET is a repellent for Lone Star ticks. Yes. So there's good data from a, a tick entomologist, a specialist on that. So and then I have another question if you want to respond to that one. Sure. Uh, and my other question is how far do females, reproductive females, disperse? You mentioned that male who had gone two miles back and forth in one night. And I'm wondering about females thinking about what's the possibility of one pregnant female recolonizing an area? Well, I we don't have any hard fast data on that. We do know the females would travel long distances just like the males. Uh, so again, the situation we put them in was not maybe as natural because we were releasing them into a new, in some cases we were releasing them into a new environment. So that female may travel further, but that might be an artifact of the situation she was placed in. And if you're a lone nutria, regardless of male or female, you're probably going to seek out other nutria. And I would have to look, but all of them traveled quite some distance from where they were two to five to six, 10 miles from maybe where they were originally released. And that could be a straight line distance. So the animal itself probably traveled much further. But again, they, they don't have, you know, that's, that's what they do. They don't have YouTube or Facebook, you know, they're just gonna go move about their environment and, and hope to find other nutria. Yep. Money, so you're, you, oh, 
Yeah. So your success uh, 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 eliminating nutria from some areas, that's really remarkable. That, that's, a, that's an incredible achievement for an animal that disperses that easily by water. If there's water, they can, they can disperse. And uh, it is going to be interesting to see some of the research that might come out of California because their water systems are really connected too. And it's a, it's a much different environment. So we're really interested to see some of the things that they might learn in their work. And they're very um, um, prolific. They can have a lot of babies. Yes, very prolific. So a female is sexually mature at six months. And once she breeds, it's about six months again for gestation. Once they have the young, two days later, she's receptive again. So once a female is sexually mature in a, in a normal population, she's pregnant the majority of her life. And I second that, Jean. I mean, this, this has been a, when we, we hear about invasive species and exotics, this has been um, a success story. Uh, are there still nutria in 17 states or have they gone more? And is climate change going to bring uh, more nutria up north? and uh, from the south where they are? Um, and are you taking your show on the road and going to different states and trying to replicate it? That's, you know, that's a million dollar question of how climate change will <laughs> impact species ranges. I mean, it certainly could if the winters, which have historically kept them low, you know, at certain ranges, Yes, they could expand. The good news for the Delmarva Peninsula is we are, you know, we have removed, hopefully, the problem from the peninsula. We are an island, we're protected by the bay. Reinvasion risk is, is relatively low. We are now, the, the risk would be Virginia, and that's where we're focusing our efforts uh, with our institutional knowledge, our physical resources, we're helping Virginia as they decide how they're going to tackle their nutrient problem. And again, we work with different states, we've worked with different countries, we've had researchers from Israel out, uh, they were interested in understanding some of the behavior aspects of nutria, they, they came out, uh, one of the research student or one of the, I think he was a PhD from, from Israel, he was looking at morphological differences and how the nutria may adapt to cold or different climates. And I haven't followed up with him recently to see if that has been published yet or not, but that was an, another interesting uh, work that he was doing, just trying to figure out, you know, are they different in California versus Maryland versus Germany? Netherlands, you know, all the different places that they are. We've had folks from South Korea, uh, China, you know, different places. Again, they're looking for methods and techniques that they can use to, to address their issues. Yeah, Ron. Um, Nutria, so, um, sorry. Oh, nope, you're muted. Uh, there we go. There we go. <laughs> um, <laughs> nutria as a food source, as in hunters and farmers, they, there's a program that um, I guess basically is set up to sort of almost um, maybe sometimes cater to the needs of the um, hungry and homeless sometimes, but I don't know if that is part of one of, of the many layers of your solution um, approach to nutrient control. Um, again, I, I, I thought I'd at least mention it to see if, if you have any comments. It, it may be something that could be used in states like maybe Louisiana, someplace like that. The, 
issue with the donation of the meat is you need to make sure that it's approved. You know, it has to, you can't, it's got to be safe to consume. I don't think that that would necessarily be a problem. I think you could potentially do that. And as we were talking before this got started, there is a startup group that was using Nutria as the base for their dog food. So there, you know, there's a lot of different options here. And I think, you know, the more people that get involved, the more thought, you know, there's, there's a potential for some really creative solutions. All right, any other questions? Wonderful, thank you so much, Marnie. Thank you guys, sure. thank you guys. Thank you for all the work that you're doing and um, it's fascinating how you're, you're utilizing all kinds of strategies and, and the dogs and this wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, well maybe someday in the future, 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 we can come out and, and do a dog demo. That would be awesome. We'd love to have you over here um, and, and see what we have. And I don't think we have, a, we don't have a stuffed Nutria or uh, in our collection. So if you have any around, we'll take one. <laughs> okay, yeah, definitely, <laughs> definitely. And I think we might be able to work something out if that is uh, because we are, again, very closely working with Virginia. They do have Nutria. So we might be able to, to get you one for a mount. That would be wonderful. All right, everybody stay safe and stay curious. We'll see you next week when we learn about plankton, if not before. And uh, thank you again, uh, Marnie. Take care and take care of those dogs. Thank you. Thank you all. Have a good evening. All right, thank Outstanding you. Outstanding talk, Marnie. Outstanding. Thank you so much. I appreciate it.